I actually mentioned the other day on a different um, on a different podcast that I had recently returned from a four day training event. It was awesome. Uh, I was out in Nevada with uh, Joe Dawson, Bruiser, Bruiser Industries, and a Ooh. bunch of other folks. Yeah, Joe's a good dude. Um, and this was long distance rifle. We used carbines for two days, mm-hmm. and we used uh, um, sorry bolt guns on the other two days. And so very very similar. A lot of things cross over, but things things are different, but the same. And each day he challenged us with a physical like challenge at the end, you know, a little competition, which is which is pretty typical when you go out to these range sure, days. Yeah. You're learning these skills, uh, you know, what's the practical application? And the 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 skill challenge was around making these long distance shots from barricades. And so there were several barricades set up different types of barricades, which created various levels of challenge in terms of what level you had to get down or up to. In order to uh, stabilize the rifle, st- there were stability issues with some of the barricades, which was part of it. Um, some in some case you had to get down very low, um, you know, kind of in one of those awkward positions. Like I'm not in prone, but I'm not in kneeling. Like how do I get there? So how do you use the tools that you have, bags, even your gear or equipment, in order to set up a stable shooting position? Um, there was movement from one to the other, so they, they were separated. You know those huge spools. Like that, uh, mm-hmm. the wire you'd see yeah. like, traveling down the road on the back of a truck or whatever, mm-hmm. or on the back of a train, you know, that had wire or cable, or whatever. So these massive spools out there. So you'd have to transition from one of those across maybe 10 yards to some barrels that were set up or to a ladder or to some type of a barricade. And for those people that shoot, they kind of get it. And I think the people that maybe don't shoot, they can kind of picture what I'm talking about. So if you, you know, when you get in the longer range stuff, if you're out on the, the range, typically with your pistols or your carbines, it's a little bit lighter equipment, right? Like at least the the goal is to keep a, you know, sort of a compact profile enough to get done what needs to get done, but you don't want too much because you want to be mobile. Uh, but when you start getting into these longer range, you know, firearms, there's more to it. Like there's a bigger optic, there's sometimes longer barrels. That's an interesting part of this. And that'll be for an After Dark podcast. I have a lot to say about <laughs> Barrel lengths and how what you what they're capable of and what they're not. Fourteen five can hit thousand yards. Uh, yeah, you said it. Um, people, are, <laughs> trolls on the internet are going to come out and go like that. This nah. it can't be done. Range I watched it get wrong. done. We did it several times, but that's um that's, again another I another yeah. another topic for another time. Uh, the sorry, so you're 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 dealing with more stuff, right? Uh, bipods on the end of your on on the end of your rifles, just heavier chassis. A heavier ammo, a uh, lot of things, and um, you're moving and and effectively shooting, if you will. Uh, so there are there are actual uh, PRS matches that challenge you to do these things. So the people that shoot PRS, they know what I'm talking about. So there's a certain level of strength that you have to have, endurance, uh, high level of endurance, because when you're shooting those distances and you're trying to make be accurate, your breathing, your and your right. heart rate and respiratory rate impact things dramatically uh, as you're trying to hold steady on a target or, or whatever else. So anyhow, again, if you go to these things, like you notice right away the things that people may have been very good at when shooting already stabilized in a prone position uh, and in a very controlled environment. Uh, and what I mean by that is just very calculated and there's not a lot of movement, if you will. It's very, look, the word would be static. Mm. Uh they can be, they're very, very accurate. But as soon as you start adding a little stress to the the drill or to the, to the challenge, again, I mentioned heart rates, movement, things like that. You watch the best shooters start to fall apart. Some of them, not all mm-hmm. of them. Uh, and so here's, I'm a nerd, right? And I'm a freak. And I know you guys are too. Like we see people be sitting down at the restaurant or whatever eating in the... <laughs> The lady or the dude walks by and you're just watching the gate pattern and going, oh my God, yeah. look at that. Look at the, yeah, look at the pronation. Yeah, look at, <laughs> look at that, that egg disaster. beater. Yeah, look at that egg beater. It's just kind of what goes through our heads or whatever on top of the situational awareness and anything else we might be looking at just kind of pops up. And so I'm studying and watching, you know, what's going on. And uh, a lot of times when you start on these things, and that's the way this particular culture start, we had to run about 50 yards. To, to start. So it's long enough yeah, with your gear, sure. right, in order to get your heart rate up. So you had, that had to be managed. But you're running forward straight line. Now, a lot of people looking out there, maybe they're not runners or maybe they're not super athletes, but that's not something they're going to have a really tough time doing. Now, throw 16 pounds, 15, 16 pounds in your arms, 
right? And you were allowed to take one piece of equipment, whether that's a shooting bag or a backpack or whatever you were going to use. You got, you got to take one piece of equipment with you. So you have that. So it's awkward. You run with a lot of weight. It's out in front and uh, you're, you're trying to kind of hang on to things. And then you have to go up and you have to, sh- you have to sit up. So that's the first part. And then at any, at any given point, you have to move laterally from station to station because there's a firing line. Uh, so you had to move, move laterally. And then as you're moving and maneuvering around things, you're rotating the, your, yourself, you're rotating your firearm, you're having to find your way into these tight, you know, these tight and confined sometimes or even just kind of awkward spaces. And so what I was picking up was nobody's having problems with the getting up, getting down. So the vertical movement. Mm. Uh, nobody's having problems sort of with the flexion and extension. That is just kind of picking the rifle up, putting it out in front of them. But things started to wildly fall apart whenever we got into the lateral movements and the rotational movements. And they were part of all of that. So there's this this kind of this combined, you know, movement pattern, which is very complex. And you've got this extension of you or your body with the firearm. So for those people that are like, dude, I don't shoot. How does this relate to me? Whatever else. Well, you see the same stuff go uh, go on when you go to the ski slopes, you know. And I see people on skis or st- people on um, people on on snowboards or whatever. Same if you're if you're in a in some type of a club sport, uh, it's the same. There's an extension of your body and your your ability to control that. And so what I looked at, uh, and by the way, a lot of these guys who are out there, they work out. Yeah. It's clear. I mean, you look at them, and go, yeah. okay, this bro lifts. Mm. Like, but what they're what I what I'm recognizing is. Probably the two most overlooked things in most of these guys' program, and even after talking with them in between the sessions and, and after, is that nobody rotates and nobody's moving laterally in their movement or in their exercise program. If they are, it's very minimal and it's not necessarily planned. So I wanted to talk about like what I feel are the two most overlooked movement patterns in any power and strength programming. And that is, if you're just trying to be fit for action or a weekend warrior or whatever else, or just generally healthier, why aren't people rotating more and why aren't they moving laterally more? And so uh, it's no surprise when I when I see this stuff happen out there where things kind of fall apart. So that's just kind of the intro to where we're going with this. But let's talk about these two, these two movement patterns. Let's just talk about movement patterns in general to maybe wrap the heads, some heads around what we're talking about here. So let's talk about rotation. Mm-hmm. Where do we see rotation um, uh, in general? In if even if you're not working out, because I don't think people really think about this. Um, putting my seatbelt on, reaching behind myself in the car yeah. to grab something, <laughs> picking my groceries up and putting them in the car. Exactly. I mean, that's every day kind it, of thing. Yeah. So this is like your activities of daily living, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, obviously, those are obvious ones. I don't think people think about that. They think more about. I had to squat down to get the grocery bag <laughs> off the floor. They don't think about you just squatted and rotated to get the bag. Getting the it out bag. of your cart. Right. Too. Getting it out of your cart and putting it in somewhere. Yeah. I mean, this so rotation is a is just a moving pattern we do all the time anyways. Mm-hmm. Just why doesn't it ever go into a an exercise program? It does here. Oh, it does here, <laughs> but I think a lot of people just don't don't choose it yeah. because like how is this going to impact me aesthetically? Am I going to see this in the mirror? Oh, yeah. Can I feel this in the clothes that I wear? Is somebody going to say, hey, those are great rotational muscles that I see. You know, you've really been working on there versus it's like. so hot. Dude, wow. your, arms, your arms look great. Like your shoulder, your yeah, glutes dude, look you, great. Yeah, you're popping. Like, yeah. no, I get it. No, like, your internal rotators team. look fantastic. Dude, your old glutes <laughs> are fucking so cut. Yeah. No, I get it. It's a rough Well, one. what about those serratus? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you don't. No one knows about those. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. Hidden muscles. I think that's that's a good part of it. People are just probably unfamiliar with it um, until something happens where they become familiar with their lack of rotation. Well, if you're an athlete, bottom line is you're rotating, right? Baseball, hockey, golf, anything. Like walking, this running. Any overhead sport. Yeah. Ambulation. Yeah. Like literally walking. I step forward, my pelvis rotates to one side, my upper body rotates to the other mm-hmm. side. That's how I create power to create gait. Yep. Walking, right? running, you got it. So yeah, I know you see people that when they walk, they look super stiff and both hips are rotating, right? They kind of look like they're walking with their hips. That's not supposed to happen, right? You're supposed to have one ilium move and your whole body rotates in this plane to create a nice gait and movement where you see a lot of people where this is down regulated whether they've had an injury they don't know what's going on with their pelvis it stops moving whatever they don't they train sit too much. rotation they mm-hmm. sit too much right they're tight yep um 
you see that heavily. And then you start to see them literally rotating through their lumbar spine, which has four to 14 degrees, depending on your anatomy. But that's how much rotation the lumbar spine has. So we're literally rotating either via thoracic spine mm -hmm. or the hips. And once we get to our thoracic end range, I now need to bring the hips into it or I'm going to over rotate through my lumbar spine and cause an injury. Yeah. So that's, the, let's, let's, that's a great, like, just kind of picture of what's going on. And some people might've lost you with the four to 14 degrees or whatever, but, but understanding your anatomy is a little bit important here. And I think with a higher level of understanding, you might get a little bit more compliance to doing some of these movements or, you know, or want to, or drive mm -hmm. to integrate them in. But the lumbar spine is not designed to rotate. No. It isn't. There's very, very, of the four to 14 degrees you're talking mm -hmm. about through, yeah. th through thoracic spine, there's less than that at the lumbar spine. At the, and it only happens at the top. Think, yeah. think <laughs> around it gets down to the bottom, maybe. L4, L5, right? Yeah. Um, so. Um, what about L4, or, L5? Sorry. So, sorry, L, L, L1 and 2, okay. right? At the yeah. top are, are rotating a little bit. As you start to get further down, L4, L5, certain, certainly as you get into like where it connects to sacrum. the sacrum, there's not any rotation there. Mm. Um, there's movement, but it's not made to rotate. That is meant to be very stable and almost, I, I'm going to use the word, but almost stiff, mm -hmm. right? It's like your, this is your anchor point and everything above, because everything above and below that is supposed to be rotating. So if you're, if you're demanding that your body rotates above that and you don't have the mobility to, in order to make that rotation, again, at thoracic spine, as we move up and get closer mm -hmm. into the shoulder girdle and into the neck, then your body has to pick up that rotation somewhere, right? And it may go down to the hips and try to pick it up there, or it may try to go above the stiffest or or a point that doesn't have rotation above where it should be rotating at, yeah. the, at the thoracic level. So you might start to see it more up near the shoulders. That's going to create downstream problems. But, you know, I, I don't want to make this all about getting injured, but I, there's not a person listening to this right now that doesn't know somebody with lumbar or low back issues it's one in five people are reporting low back pain. Uh, and a, a lot of that likely has to do with weakness and the inability to support their structure through the movement patterns that they're asking them to move them, move them through or demanding that they move them through, aside from any acute injuries that may have happened along the way. But I'm talking more about performance and what could be aiding in your increase in strength and power. You want to have all of those movements. And what you don't want is your body going to a place to find rotation that doesn't have rotation, i.e. the lumbar spine. Uh, so uh, how do you, again, so th that, that's, a, we, we talked about like, where do you find these movements? When do you see them? You see them in, act in everyday activity or what we call activities of uh, daily living, ADLs. But you guys just, you know, we just sort of, said, hey, here's some sports or here's some activities outside that, that you're going to see that. But we also talked about like, hey, a lot of these injuries that people know about are happening in a state of rotation and the inability to, to dynamically stabilize in those rotational pieces. I mean, how many people do you know that are blown out an ACL? A lot. Uh, I, Meniscus and ACL. Yeah, way more people than I can than I can count. It's it's, it's a lot of people. We already talked about the percentage of people that have like, like uh, low back injuries. Mm -hmm. But that 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 happens in rotation, yeah. right? Something's going on, and you don't have the ability. Foot gets plant. There's a valgus uh, force at the knee, so an inward force at the knee, and then they're trying to move the laterally other the other direction. And so, yeah, that's what you, typical mechanism of injury for an ACL. Yeah. So the that it's and most people have done that somehow. ACL, correct me if I'm wrong, is one of the the highest degrees of non contact injuries there there are out there. So mm -hmm. this is you don't even have to get. It's not a car accident. It's not a motorcycle crash. This isn't, you know, getting hit. This is just changing right, direction. Yep. This Straight is on. just changing direction or trying to decelerate forces of, is, is another way of looking at that. So, again, not boring people. Um, I don't want to make this about it. This isn't an injury talk. You should train rotation so you don't get injured. You should train rotation to be healthier, yep. stronger, and be Global. able to cr create yeah. more, more force and power. So... Where do you start with the rotation piece in, in your exercise program if you've really never thought about this? And, and here's an example. Like if you're a power lifter, you probably never do any rotation, right? You're on that platform or you're on that bench. and That is it. You're underneath that bar. When you're using barbells, there's not a lot of rotation happening most of the time. Yeah. And now, if there is, you're going to have a serious issue because <laughs> of that asymmetry coming through the barbell. Correct. I mean, straight up. If you're taking that barbell from the floor to overhead and you're rotating, yep. right? 
uh, you're rotating at all, you're asking for trouble. Yes. If, if you put the bar down and one side is in front of the other one, you are rotated. Then there's when you're, some, then when there's you're some deadlift, like yeah. in a deadlift. Exactly. Deadlift but the barbell deadlift. Right. right? You, you put that bar on the ground, you got one, one arm in front of the other one, you're rotating. So something to be said because a lot of people, you know, have latched on to, there's a lot of value in, in powerlifting, deadlifting, mm -hmm, squatting, sure. bench pressing, and things like that. But uh, you're probably not practicing any uh, any any level of rotation uh, consciously. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so that's that's one of those sports. The other thing is like if I'm if you're strictly doing physique and bodybuilding type type exercises, you're probably not consciously putting any of these things into your your exercise program or routine. It's just not. Again, if the it's goal hard to rotate in a corset, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, oftentimes you see is like we're belting up yeah. so that we don't rotate, right? Um, we're, we're, we're wrapping up so that we don't rotate. Uh, so, look, if I wanted to add in some, some rotation or become better at rotation, I, th I think the first thing you have to do is understand, like, what's my current level? Mm -hmm. um, like, how do you guys suggest people sort of assess that? What are some things they can do to understand? Well, I mean, if you're, we're going to break it down to the very beginning when somebody comes in here, I'm going to look at how they stand in front of me statically, but then also get them moving. So I'll have them put their hands on their hips and I'll have them rotate their torso, keeping their, their hips still um, and comparing both sides. And I'll look at them from the front. I'll look at them from the back and from the side. I'll have them laterally side bend. So that's where they're... Um, leaning to the side. So shoulder to the floor. I'll look at at that on both sides. I'll also take a look at um, their neck and see what kind of rotation they have up there. So just to kind of get a better idea of what do they have actively. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on the person, I might even get hands on and um, move them passively. They're active and then passively move them into an end range to see how, um, how can, much more can we rotation get? Yeah, can I get from them. Now, this is an easy thing for people to do in front of the mirror, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like you want to kind of see for yourself. You don't have to have a professional, you know, and know the to the, the degree, you know, how many how many degrees of rotation you have one way or another. But, you know, one thing to do is just stand sh feet shoulder width apart in front of your mirror, arms out to the sides, just straight up like in a T mm -hmm. and just rotate each way slowly, not, not quickly, slowly and try to get into as much rotation as you can without your feet moving, right, uh, underneath you. You can go ahead, let the hips rotate. Like mm -hmm. just, but just don't let those feet pivot on the floor mm -hmm. and see how far you can get going all the way to the right or clockwise and how far you can get all the way to the left counterclockwise. And you're going to be able to see it. Oh yeah. Uh, you're going to have one. And you're going to be able to see it. And you're going to feel like, holy shit, like I'm really tight. I can't. You have can't. one side that's going to be tighter all day. Yeah. You guys ever find that it's like the dominant side that they have the less range from mm -hmm. versus yep. the yep. Yeah. So opposite side, they're going to rotate better too. Yeah. You know? Usually you're going to have more range to your non-dominant side. And people will be like, well, that doesn't make any sense because I'm a stronger. Lot of sense. Why? <laughs> I mean, you, because chances are you're not going to have as much muscular development on that side. And number on one. The, on the weak side. On the weak side. To restrict the movement. And if you're a very athletic person, you're using that arm to swing and hit a ball, yeah. let's say, the, right? So oh, I'm, constantly, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. constantly rotating the opposite direction, whether I'm reaching for tennis to get a hit on my right. other side, right? I'm rotating with my dominant arm to the opposite side. Hockey, baseball, all everything is coming from my dominant hand, switching over to the offside. Yeah, right. so it's so it's a it's a function of the activity. Like you, you should expect mm -hmm. this. This is not uncommon, and it's not unnormal or abnormal. Yeah. It's just going to happen over time. So, yeah. like I played hockey for years, I can rotate to the left side. Great, my right side sucks. Yeah. Very tight. Yeah, I mean, I'm a right-handed athlete. Like I always, always have been. You start to get me to rotate, to, you know, to my left, right? right? And I'm gonna, I have limited rotation, and it starts from the floor. And it works all the way up to the back of your head. Sure. So we can talk about that in a minute. But yeah, so when people see that, they're like, oh, shit. Okay, so here's my limitation. They're not, again, you don't have to know degrees, but it's like, okay, I am limited in rotation to this side. Now, there are things that are impacting that. What are the things that we talked about just tight tissue? You're overdeveloped on one side, mm -hmm. right? And that that tissue becomes to be, uh, begins to become a little tighter uh, or less mobile. Uh, the integrity of it can start to... Uh, be compromised a little bit because it's being quote unquote overused. Mm -hmm. It's overactive. Uh, that's, you know, that's a, 
that that word I think could be you know, misused, but at the same time, it that's kind of what's going on. Anyone seen a pitcher get injured? It's an overuse athlete throughout their mm-hmm. yep. the, the league, right? They've gotten they prepped up, but then they've literally overused those muscles throughout the season. Yep, and they sometimes blow out their rotator cuff, et cetera, et cetera. Right, all these injuries. So yeah, so let's try not to let's try not to blow people's brains up too much. But I want to talk about like myofascial lines, mm-hmm. right? And so because I think people can. Can, can get this without being overly confused. You're turning me I on think, with, these, so, with this. I, was gonna say, <laughs> I think before we get to, to that big term, something just to have in front of us to think about is that um, our muscles are made of striations, right? They're mm-hmm. striations. And the striations of the muscles don't run linearly. They don't run vertical and they don't necessarily always run horizontal. So they do wrap around the body. They do have diagonal patterns to them. So when we think about rotation and we think about the muscles that we're using to incorporate the rotation, those muscles are the muscles where their striation patterns are diagonal or they wrap around the body. So um, before we get into the the myofascial lines, I think it's important for people to understand that um, I guess it's the angle of the muscles and, and how they're going to fire and how they're going to impact movement. Which creates so much integrity, all the different crossing over and the layering. So it doesn't look like fiberglass like you'd put down on a surfboard. Like if anybody's ever seen a, a baseball with the skin off of it, right? You, you pull the pull the cover off of the baseball. It looks like a ball of yarn, right? These things mm-hmm. are going, that's effectively what you look like from a muscular system and a fascia system underneath. There's very, very specific directions are running. It doesn't look like chaos, but it might to the untrained eye, like, but you've got these crossover patterns and each one of those things connects to something else. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work in isolation. And this is what people need to understand. So yeah, you have these fibers that go all these different directions. It's the same as the bodybuilder trying to train, say the deltoid, right? So you've got these different fiber directions that that muscles, that muscle, that cap of the shoulder goes in. And they're very specific about the direction and how they load that movement pattern as to impact very specific things within that shoulder, whether it's the rear medial or front side delt, if you want to call it that. So um, that's, that's, again, if you can think like that, like your muscles like that, we go back to the myofascial lines. That's how essentially everything in your body is held together, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of ligaments and tendons. So you have these, this, this basically connective tissue that basically ties all the things in. And I mentioned from your, from your ankle, all the way up to the top of your head, front side, back side, you know, and around your body, mm-hmm. everything's connected with these myofascial lines. Mm-hmm. And that, again, all that means is this muscle is connected to that muscle, which is con- and tendon, which is connected to this next tendon and muscle, and the next thing and the next thing and next thing. Nothing is in isolation. So if you think about that long chain, if it was just a straight line, if any point in that chain is overly tight, it's going to affect everything above and below that. Mm-hmm. So like if you've got like some soreness at, let's say the end of the chain, that doesn't necessarily mean that's where your issue is, right? Or when I say soreness, I mean like tightness or maybe even like some irritation or what might feel like an injury, like a pull or a strain, if you will, that might not, have, it might not be there. It Or maybe it is, it could just be a result of an insult or further in the chain, like in the middle of that chain, and you're just feeling it out here because this is the part that's getting the most overworked. So it's great that you said that because like the middle of the chain, when we start looking at the hamstrings and there's a ligament that goes from hamstrings um, up to your sacrum, up to your erectors, right? And this fascia. Erectors are low back muscles, conti- extenders. Yeah, extenders. continuous, right? So when I hinge over, I do something like I pick up, I deadlift, right? If that tissue is not sliding and gliding, I am going to use my low back to create the range of motion in which I need to hinge to whatever I'm trying to pick up from the ground, mm-hmm. right? So being able to have this fascia and awareness, and this is the, probably the biggest one that I see, is the hamstrings getting tight, restricting the pelvis from rotating up towards the ceiling. So anaverting, so reaching forward, right? Sit bones rotate up towards the ceiling where I'm trying to get my torso at a horizontal line mm-hmm. and my legs, I'm literally perpendicular to my legs is what I'm trying to do, mm-hmm. right? But those hamstrings get so tight from sitting where I lose awareness, And then the pelvis starts dumping forward. I reach into a lumbar flexion and I grab and I pick up these things, Mm -hmm. right? So biggest one that I see, and that's a fascial line, right? Mm -hmm. It is the hamstring I'm talking about, but it literally connects from like you're talking about from the back of your foot all the way up to the back of your head on the occiput, right? On the back of the skull. And so what you're talking about is the weak link in there. And people are going like, I have tight hamstrings. No, you have weak hamstrings. Yeah. That starts with that. And now they feel tight. 
because they're not sliding and gliding. Exactly. And you want to get down on the floor and force the slide and the glide through stretching mm-hmm. when what they need is strength mm-hmm. and mobility and awareness exactly. to be able to allow them to move through the range of motion within that tissue that exists. Yeah. That's I think it's a good example because then it transfers right over to what we're talking about with rotation because if you're trying to rotate and you get into that arms out position where I said, and you're standing in front of the mirror and you rotate around and go, oh, I feel that on my low back. Okay. That's where you're feeling it, mm. feeling it and where it's actually coming from or could be two could be things. very yeah. different things. Absolutely. Yeah. Just like, oh, it's my low back and I need to do that, um, like a squirt, not, not the opposite of a scorpion. What are you just, you're laying, you're, you're laying a uh, soup on the floor, uh, chest up and you pull that leg over the other leg, the opposite leg and stretch yeah. it out in front of you while trying to keep your, your shoulders on the floor, kind mm-hmm. of like the iron cross type yeah, yeah. type stretch or whatever, or the Hollywood where you're sitting and you cross the opposite arm mm-hmm. over the opposite knee and, and you're, oh, the you're Hollywood. pulling away. Yeah, that's what they were called when I was playing football. <sighs> like that? Or Hollywoods. Yeah. Huh. I've been doing that since I've I'm never heard it Hollywoods. called the Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're feeling that in your lower back and that's just, that's where the, the restriction feels, but it could be due to weakness above mm-hmm. or below that, that, that point. So again, try not to blow people, you know, get, turn people off to this conversation, but we look at these myofascial lines, you can see if you peeled the skin back and you peeled the fat back and whatever, and we're just, we're left without, um, you know, you, you can kind of see through this translucent layer, um, into the anatomy. And let's just say all the muscles were red and you can see underneath it. What you'd see is like these crossing mm-hmm. over like X's throughout the body. You could, you could trace them very easily. So if you look from like the right shoulder to the left hip, mm-hmm. uh, on the back and on the front side, you're going to yep. see an X the there. Oblique sling. Yeah, the mm-hmm. oblique sling. You're going to start to see things from the front hip to the front shoulder on opposite sides, and then various points along the way. Um, you know, in the in the pelvis, it's very complex. You're going to see all kinds of crossing over of these things, and so with the rotational piece, just because we're talking about rotation, we let's keep it upper extremity. Mm-hmm. That for now, if you're going from the right hip to the left shoulder, I'm looking at you from the backside now. You're looking at it from the right hip to the left shoulder. Everything below that left hip that's connected to that left hip is part of that chain, mm-hmm. right? So um, there, are the you go back to the hamstring example that you're talking about. So if that left hamstring is tight, right, and or weak, is what we what we're effectively saying, and you're having to dip into that low back in order to get into that hinge. What do you think your your rotation is going to look like as you start to move counterclockwise? That is bringing your right shoulder in front of you that now pulls on that X, that line that's connected to that left hip. It's going to restrict you. So um, again, where does this come back to the rotation? Are you giving me an anatomy lesson or are, you giving, are we talking about rotation here? Well, it all matters because as we start to get into that rotational component and where the injuries come from, people are going, oh, my back, it's my back that's tight. No, that shit started below your back. Mm-hmm. Your back feels tight and now there may be an injury there because that's the part that doesn't rotate mm-hmm. because you were tight and, and weak, right? More specifically, you put your, your body went into rotation, maybe had to decelerate something or whatever, and that was the weakest point in the chain or it didn't it couldn't pick up that rotation anywhere else, so it went to the lumbar spine to try to find it. Guess what? Lumbar spine wasn't supposed to rotate, and now here you are left with, a, you know, an injury or soreness or a pull or a tear, like a strain or a tear or something like that. So um, that that's just making the case for how to think about your rotation and, and what's going on. If I was going to, so that's an assessment, like, where am I tight? Mm-hmm. That's how to think about like, okay, I'm feeling it here and I see that. Now, where are the points in the chain? How do I start to include rotation into my program to help improve this so that I can be stronger and more powerful? I think there's a few different ways to think about this. Um, here's what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel weak and I need to strengthen. I'm going to go over to the the Dynamax balls and pull the Dynamax ball off the do rack and start rotation. doing ballistic rotations. <laughs> Hard and as powerful as I can. Like, uh, please don't do that. Like, it's not the place to start, right? So, Because that's so great that you picked up on that because no one trains any other muscle like transverse plane going straight into ballistics and power like everyone else is. Like you're talking about, they go to Dynamax ball or med ball. Yeah, it's crazy, right? slamming against the wall as fast as they can. They have no good pattering, right? Mm-hmm. They need repattering moments and more proprioception. They don't have it. And then they're literally going into the most demanding movement, which is power. And any fucking motor pattern that I have that is the best is going to take over in that regardless of my mind is I'm going to focus on this 
You're yeah. going to have a shitty motor pattern because you are literally calling on like the most expansive movement, right? As I snatch overhead, if I have horrible movement, I'm going to pick that bar up the way my body knows the strongest and it's probably not the best. That's a really mm -hmm. good, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. To see the things people do kind of right out of the gate and it winds up in a lot of programs because it's easy, it's dynamic and it's sexy. It's easy to put in there, you know, like doesn't take a lot of setup and it's dynamic and it it is ulti sexy. Ult ultimately it's sexy. But uh, yeah, good, very good point. Mm -hmm. The the other thing that I think we need to talk about here when we're talking about rotation is this concept of anti-rotation, right? And and we can get into that, right? How that doesn't, how that may or may not help you, yeah, in in your efforts here. So you'll see there there's different camps in this, but mm -hmm. um, um, I am in the camp of so anti-rotation. That is being having an external load mm -hmm. placed on on your body to where you have to dynamically resist that and mm -hmm. in at Try and stay in a static position. Basically, stay Stabilize, keep all yeah. of your structure stabilized. So, right? if I had my arm straight out in front of me, mm -hmm. like at and and parallel to the floor, so like at shoulder height, mm -hmm. and my my palms were pushed together or clasped together, and then you, you know, you you or CC stood across from me and tried to pull my body into rotation or push my body into mm -hmm. rotation. Anti rotation would be me trying to stay still and exactly. resist that movement. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that is a great way to get somebody to become aware mm -hmm. of the rotators that they have and dynamic sure. stabilizers as we get down into the global and mm -hmm. intrinsic intrinsic stabilizers that help your spine, you know, and your pelvis and all the things stay stable. Uh, I think it's a great way to get somebody's attention and start to get them to be aware of how they should be breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about bra bracing uh, and teaching somebody to brace. It's a great way to teach somebody how to brace. Mm -hmm. uh, but doing an overloading anti-rotation thinking that's going to make you better at rotation. Mm -mm. That's backwards thinking. It's an aware, for me, it's an awareness drill. Agreed. And regardless of how you do it, I like to have people on the floor. They'll be uh, supine, supine, arms down to the ground, legs down to the ground. I'll have them close their eyes, resist into the floor, start lifting their arms, lifting their legs, whatever. You can have them multiple different positions. But once that awareness is there, we got to move on. We're rotating. Yeah. Because now you're aware, like the anti-rotation is... I don't know where that came from. It, it, like, again, it's great for awareness, but where it's like you're talking about progressively overload with weight and all of this stuff. It's like, I, I rotate when I walk. Why am I trying to not teach rotation at the basic form? I racked my brain one time to figure out, like, is there any sport that requires a, like that at the highest level, like at the highest degree over time? Like what, what sport would you get into where anti-rotation is critical to the success of winning or losing? Right, or, or specifically winning. I could only come up with one, and I don't even know if you could call it a sport, and it's because I worked with a guy who raced this. He raced F1 cars. Oh, cars. So like fighter pilots and stuff like yes. that. I get it, yeah. So that that could be a case for that. I I would bet that the population of this audience is listening to right now does not fit into that category. Sure. If you know somebody, maybe you talk to them about it. So for everybody else, we just talked about how important that rotation is, and if you don't have it, what could happen Again, not making it an injury thing, but more about you're not going to be able to perform at your highest level in terms of producing or building strength and producing the, and reducing forces, like mm -hmm. power, yeah. right? So, yeah, the Paloff press. So this is the one that where you're attached to a tube or a like a piece of tubing. What same position with my hands that I just described, but I have a piece of tubing um, or like a band in my hand, and I'm resisting where I'm bringing it into my to my chest in a in a pressing fashion and then I'm pushing it back out again. I think there's some value to the pile mm -hmm. off press but it's very limited, yep. right? Okay. After that you need to get into rotation cuz why am I trying to train strength in in a static position? Yeah. I need to train strength in the movements that we just talked mm -hmm. about we do every day all day and certainly in sport which is being able to rotate or resist rotation through beyond Neutral, mm. because that position, that Paloff position is a neutral spine yep. or should be performed in a neutral spine position, right? And that's not where our, where we play in the game of life. It just yeah, isn't, yeah. or in sport for that matter. So that's not going to help you for very long. It's a great way to build awareness, great way to maybe rebuild some stability if you've had some type of an acute injury or you've mm. got a lot of instability. Mm -hmm. Good. Start there, but don't stay there. Don't, yeah. don't live there. We need to get right into Bad some move. rotation. So... The next thing would be just take that pile off press and turn it into a rotation. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like just don't don't worry about the pressing piece. Get some resistance in there. Set yourself up and maybe it's a cable tubing, 
uh, or band and start to rotate into that active range of motion as far as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and if you really wanted to get, uh, get fancy and party, you could have somebody help passively push you into a little bit of a deeper range That's of motion say, yeah. mm -hmm. so that you're training those end ranges that you may yeah. not have access to right now without externally pushing you into those. So when we talk and about- Slowly controlling it out of that yeah. um, rotational pattern. So from the end range and then making sure you're slowly controlling it back to the beginning or your start position. So, so, so to give people that may have lost this there. So I've got the, I've got the handles out in front of me. Mm -hmm. I'm rotating all the way to my left as far as I can. Mm -hmm. And I get to that end point where I can't move it anymore. Then I have Jeff just give me a push for maybe another whatever inch, yep. just that extra little bit. You'll probably find you have more than an inch to go oh, yeah. uh, as you get into that. And then the most important part about this is when Jeff takes his hands off me, that I don't snap back, exactly. that I control myself out of there. In fact, if he's a good coach, he may even be able to give me just enough pressure to be able to still control and work at the same rate or uh, at the same time. Just and then we can you can change the feedback yeah. over time as we come back. And then again, moving all the way into that other range or other, other sorry, the other, like the clockwise range yeah. of motion. Because you have two sides thing. that are working, mm -hmm. right? It's not just the side I rotate to works. As I come back the other way, I'm rotating the opposite direction. So we have yep. one working on deceleration and one working on the concentric mm -hmm. piece, right? The acceleration, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's extremely important one to, like you're talking about, go to your end range where you feel the rotation ends. I'm able to take someone past that. Okay, push into my hand, push into my hand. Okay, like I can manage the tension there, whereas they have an external load, they're going to manage whatever that external load is, right? Yep. But me as a coach, like you're talking about, I should be able to titrate my tension via my hands, mm -hmm. feeling their tension, looking at their structure and be like, you know what? 10% off, 15% on, whatever that is right. for that person to where I'm pushing them almost into where they cannot control 5% off work from this fucking direction. Yeah. So that's the benefits of having a coach and have somebody knows what they're doing, get hands on with exactly. you. If you're, if you don't have that, then this is the great thing about tubing. If your band. coach doesn't touch you, fire them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> appropriately. Appropriately, yeah. I mean, yeah not not saying that. Just you know, like, Asterix. dude, it's yeah. got to be good. But like, you know, no ass cheek grabbing. Just good, yeah. solid. Asterix with touch you yeah. appropriately. Asterix uh, three. <laughs> but the. Uh, Again, the great thing about tubing or bands is that you can start with very light mm -hmm. loads and and very quickly progress or regress that by simply adding more tension to the band. You don't even need a new band. You just step a couple Body inches position, to the left or yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Whatever else. It's cheap. It's easy. Uh, and it can be done anywhere in the gym or out, outside of the gym in order to, in order to do to to apply it. The the. The next thing with that, I think the progression from there is like, I just mentioned a very sort of neutral pelvis, you know, position, you're standing, it's a very natural position in space, but we could, we could take it up a couple notches and we can start to add, right, some, um, some top down or transverse type movement. Uh, like in a wood chop, uh, mm -hmm. wood chop. Like high to low or low to high. Yeah. Exactly. So you could, you could, so now you're adding some flexion and extension maybe it w along with your rotation. So you've just added some complexity. That's Look, that's what we do in life. Again, we'd mentioned like the picking the the groceries up off the off the floor or whatever and putting them in the cupboard or out of the cart and sticking them into the SUV, whatever it happens to be. You, your body doesn't act in these or doesn't operate in these very isolated, very mm -hmm. static, perfect mm -hmm. ranges of motion, which is which again, what, what we talk about machines, we talk exactly. about free weights and all the different modalities we can use is important we train there. Do not be afraid of flexion and rotation at the same time. That is your your spine going mm -hmm. into flexion, your hips going into flexion while your body's rotating. That is a very natural thing to do. In fact, I want to be strong there. Mm -hmm. So I would train there. I would train there. Now, obviously, if you've got weakness or instability in, in the pelvis, the low spine or whatever else, then maybe that's not a place you want to go right away. You keep it a bit more... Uh, a bit more controlled from with regard to going into that flexion or extension, but you know, you could add, you start adding these things in coming from high to low or coming from low to high, excuse me, or high to low. Cause you have, you have internal, external, transverse. My, my anatomy teacher would yeah. love that. Memory, <laughs> by the way, but like literally you have fibers that run mm -hmm. internally, externally transverse, right? So we want to train all of those, but exactly. also at the same time, all of those fibers it's not just one way, right? We have mm -hmm. like a fan of four, starts to fan, fan, fan. So you have so many different angles that you can hit yep. from high to low yep. to really increase your core, right? 
Yeah, so the so the learning how to control the rotation, mm-hmm. right, and trying to maybe uh, try to build equal strength uh, on both sides yes. of the thing. So, like, on your weak side, you know, start maybe there in your set when yeah. you're the freshest and you're mm-hmm. the most, you know, uh, um, sorry, neuromuscularly yeah. aware and fresh mm-hmm. and do that and load it up. Maybe do an extra set mm-hmm. on that weaker side versus the stronger side. Um, and for whatever, for every direction that you move, you need to match that with the opposite direction, right? So again, if we're coming from high to low today, mm-hmm. then the next time go from low to high. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, those are ways to, to implement that. And again, going back to your example or what we were talking about with the, the medicine ball, until you've got good control and good awareness and you've sort of maybe balanced out that strength and you recognize now I have this extra rotation or I've increased my rotation or increased my strength and control within this rotation, then maybe add some of the more ballistic movements in there like the medicine balls. Mm-hmm. So let's say you can't uh, do it ever or you shouldn't be doing that at all, but it's just a smart progression. And when you do that, start light, light mm. yes. right? Start yep. with very little, like 2% of yep. whatever your, your body weight is, and then mm. maybe move up. We start to move into those, like those Dynamax or med ball rotational movements where we're trying to produce power. Eight Whenever we're in the power pounds, phase, right? yeah, I mean, you're looking at 5%, maybe as mm-hmm. much as 8% of your body weight in order to produce power. It's about moving lightweight fast. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's not about moving the heaviest load you can. So relax, right? On the, on, you know, the, how much weight you're, you're using for this. It's more about the control mm-hmm. through the, through those things. So that's that's a way to add rotation in. I think and just kind of walking people through it. I hope people will kind of take a, a a look at that and how to how to start to implement that into their program. And here's the thing: like when you start doing this, you're going to recognize some shit r- real fast. One, you're probably going to be sore, particularly if you're working the, sure. the eccentric movements. That is this. Yeah. That is the 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 lengthening phase of your. Um, of your movement pattern. It should be your pre-rec. Yeah, you're, you're going to feel sore. Yeah. You're going to feel sore. You're going to feel stuff you probably haven't felt before. And it might not be where you expect. You might feel it in your hips. Mm. You might feel it in your glutes. You might feel it in your groin. You know, you might feel a lot of places outside I of... I feel it in between your ribs. Yeah. And that might take you by surprise. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So there's all that stuff to, to, to be aware of, you know, just in terms of the setup. Uh, but add rotation. Add rotation into to your workouts. Understand how important this is in terms of overall performance mm. and health. Because what you're going to lose first as you get older is that. And as soon as that starts happening, obviously we have to overcompensate and you start, you know, you drop those keys on the floor, you get to my be my age, you stare at them for a second and you try to contemplate like, how am I going to get down and get those right now? Like, what's my what's my plan of action here when you start to lose that rotation and or you wind up with injuries and stuff like that, so... I guess one thing I want to say about the rotation, just to be clear with people, you can rotate with both feet flat and then rotate over, right? But as we get into a more power and explosive, you can get into a B stance, right? With the leg that you're split rotating. Oh, good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The leg that you're rotating over is the leg that is in front. So as I'm taking a step forward, right, I'm going through my step, my lengthening phase of my leg, my upper body rotates over that side. It's a natural progression. So mm-hmm. just ambulation, walking, right, movement. So as I rotate why not have my front leg forward and rotating over that leg as I do naturally, right? Now, there are times where I'm going to go and I'm going to have a straight legs, right? But just from start position to be more in a myofascially correct position would be front leg lower. It's going, the, the pelvis is rotating the opposite way as you rotate over. And I know a lot of people see kettlebell, one arm, contralateral, they go in and they rotate over that front leg, they're lunging or whatever, right? Because you can start adding rotation to RDLs, uh, Romanian deadlifts, like regular hinges. Mm-hmm. Um, in a B-stance situation, you can also do that in um, in a forward lunge or a reverse mm-hmm. lunge, right? We can start adding rotation over that front leg. I just want to really uh, reiterate that for people because once they start getting the pelvis straight, we need those hips to move. And if they don't have the thoracic rotation... I'm really glad that you brought Guess that up where we're going. because, you know, we're talking about rotation and another great way for people to start to implement rotation into the program if they haven't um, is to take that split stance or that B stance. But you know what? Let's do a single arm tubing chest press and add a little bit of a rotational component. Um, as long as you're not moving your torso forward and back, keeping your torso still, but is it like you're punching throwing a punch? Through with your, yeah, yeah, punching through with your let's, the the arm that's working or the side that has the tube, mm. um, and then rotating through your like thoracic. I'm trying to break it down for people. Um, 
through your torso uh, and get a little bit of protraction or reach through that shoulder blade and then slowly coming out of it. So then you're working then um, the eccentric component of the rotation. A lot of nuance to what you just said right there. I was but, trying to think but, about like, how can I break it down? Yeah, you're in a, you're sort of a split, you're in a split stance, right? You, you've got, you maybe you're in front of a cable machine or you have a, uh, you have a, um, a, a band or a tubing in your, in your right hand, your left foot's forward. You're again, you're in that l- almost like a lunge, mm-hmm. looks like a lunge position. Back leg's going to be straight though. So you're yeah, nice yeah. and stable, nice mm-hmm. wide base of support. Right, and then you're going to basically do a chest press, but within that chest press, what you're what you're saying is is reach through that mm-hmm. press at the end, give that rotation, give that protraction through the through shoulder through the so- shoulder blade, and then really control coming back through it and go counter rotate, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so you're working through those rotations. I don't know if that's helpful for people. We have this stuff on on our YouTube channel, so they can go they can go see it, and we'll reference that again at the end. But that's a really good point. It's a really good point, a place to kind of start working it. And God, how practical is that? Yeah, I mean, how practical is that if you're uh, if you're training for combatives? Like, fuck it, fight me on this. Yeah, like there's that is a fantastic movement, and it, stop with like trying to make it go fast, right? Or trying to make it uber heavy. Just work through the movement pattern and make sure that all of those things are working or firing in conjunction with one another, and you just feel really solid. And then over time, you transition that into. And watch how it transitions into your bag work and your mm. and your glove work or your mitt yep. work, right? Those those type of things. Um, that's a that's a that's a very very. We good want part. movement patterns to look like Michael Jackson moonwalking. Do you understand <laughs> what I'm talking about? Like smooth, Close. sexy, right. just right. fucking solid. Yeah, don't, don't think of it as a press. Think mm-hmm. of it as a rotation that has a press. Mm-hmm. Right, is, a, is a way to look at that. Quick transition right into the lateral movement because everything we just said, if you listen to any of that and that any of that resonated with you, it's the same in lateral movements, right? From the sense that things are connected. We don't just, we're just not connected front and back. We just talked about the rotational component there. We also have these lateral sling or lateral chains, mm-hmm. right? That go from, let's just say that little bony piece, lateral malleolus on the, malleolus on the outside of your ankle. Man, that's hot. Right? Woo! <laughs> you move all the way up through the knee, come through the hip, go up through the rib cage, right? All the way up to the shoulder mm-hmm. and then out through the arm, elbow and wrist. It's yep. all connected. So you have the, you have these lateral chains as well. And so again, when I see people moving laterally, there's almost always going to be rotation in that, mm-hmm. right? Because unless yeah. you're, yeah, unless you're like literally doing like a crab walk where you're trying to minimize yeah. that, you know, for people that, don't, might not know what that is. You know, it's like when you take the booty bands and you put it around your knee and Step you're keeping your, side. and you're stepping to the side laterally, yeah. call that a crab walk. Maybe it's wrapped around your ankles. Uh, there's uh, just several variations of how you might, uh, might, might add modalities to this, but you're, you're, you're not getting a lot of rotation, mm-hmm. very, very little rotation versus if you're doing like a karaoke or a side shuffle, even if you're yeah. side shuffling, you're rotating, right? Your body's rotating to a certain extent. Uh, the more advanced thing would be like an ice skater. So if you're, you, you know, you're laterally bounding from one side to the other, you're reducing, mm-hmm. you're compressing, coiling, and then yes. you're moving back to rotation is involved in, in, in all of those things, just to what degree uh, has a lot to do with uh, uh, speed and velocity. Mm-hmm. So um, force and velocity, sorry. So, um, and, and the mass, you know, that, that you're trying to move and control. Anyhow, the, the point of this is, is these lateral movements Go to the gym. How many poop people are are moving laterally doing anything? And if they are, I'm watching them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very yeah. it's a sight to see. Yeah, so where, it is. You're right because so many people they just don't move laterally. Yeah. So it's yeah. refreshing. What's the benefit there, right? Um, you know what what are the benefits to moving laterally in terms of building strength and, and well, power? You were talking about barricade work earlier, right? So just in a for in those a, shooters, yeah, exactly. So just in a position for that, and you know, if, if everyone who listens who shoots and wants to move around barricade, well, when I'm you know pre- coming up on a barricade and I get my distance, guess what? I'm going to step and I'm going to push out laterally, right? Mm-hmm. Whether that's one knee down, I'm standing with one knee up. I need to be able to move over laterally in transition. Uh, if you're a USPSA shooter. Right, I mean, tons dude, of lateral. Movement. You're going to karaoke and you're going to move and you're going to do things that the whole tactical world is like, no, 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 don't ever cross your feet, whatever. Right? right, but at the end of the day, if you can move, you're aware of your body. You can do whatever you want to with whatever you have in your hand and whatever tool it is. Mm-hmm. Right, it goes back be, to the beginning. Yeah, you're going to be a savage. Awareness, yeah. You're going to be fucking savage. Yeah. But like you're talking about moving from barricade to barricade laterally and getting, let's say, your shot off, keeping your gun down range. Well, now I have to move, and these are all specific rules. It's not real life, but. Just being able to do these certain things while moving laterally, right? As we're talking about rotation and all this stuff, it all comes into the same play. 
Yep. So whether you're an athlete, shooter, whatever. And this can be trained. You can be, you can train yourself to be more efficient and effective at it in the gym, mm-hmm. right? Or and outside of the gym for, for that sure. matter. But, you know, for, for people that are like, I don't know, again, I don't do the shooting thing. This makes zero fucking sense to me. Cool. Think about your shortstop, your second baseman, yep. your third baseman, your first baseman. How about jumping out of the way of a car? Right. Uh, Hockey. Yeah. They think it's sagittal, but it's not. Mm-hmm. You're pushing off frontal plane. You have your adductors and your glute med that are balancing one another in that in that movement pattern. The 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 list could go on and on and on. Um, if you're you know like if you're a um, if you're a distance runner and you run on the pavement uh, and you can run you know a whatever five k. Now let me take you off the pavement where there's some twists and turns on the on the trail running. And tell me you don't feel your body mm-hmm. differently and, mm-hmm. uh, at the end of that. That's because of the the extra lateral movement that you're required to dodge a rock, you know, make a quick turn, uh, you know, foot placement in a in a um, in a like sort of a non stable environment or whatever you're going through mm-hmm. again, and which is going to increase the demand on the rotational piece that happens above, you know, mm-hmm. wherever you just put your foot, counterbalance, your yeah. foot, all those yep. things. There's so many applications to this, and people don't think about that because it looks funny. That you're just moving from one side to the other, uh, maybe in the in the gym. Uh, so, that, I think that makes a case for how that can help you. How that transfers over or transitions over into your total strength and power. Well, all the same concepts apply. Going back to the rotational stuff that we talked about in terms of tissue integrity, strength. Mm-hmm. You know, where is the weakest uh, link in the chain? Where are you going to 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 give up? Where's your body going to have to give up movement when maybe it's not supposed to have that movement? Same things work in those in those lateral in those lateral lines. So, in terms of starting this, you know, the first thing to do in terms of assessing kind of what your lateral movement may or may not look like, I think we kind of have to circle it maybe back to just a little bit of stability, like in a uh, in a static position, uh, like just balance. Yep. Because whenever you're moving laterally, there is a transfer. Right there's a lateral transfer of your weight, right? And obviously, if you're up top, if you have a glove, you have a club, you have, in my, uh, you know, my example from when we started, if you've got a big heavy, you know, bolt gun, you know, with optic and all that other stuff, backpack, kit, plates, whatever, belt, any of those things that you may be you may be using in you know in recreation or in at your job or in life, whatever they happen to be. They all matter. So if you can't balance yourself like a single leg balance, and it doesn't just refer to your hips and legs, right? There's lateral movement that happens up top, and we can talk about mm-hmm. that as well as we get into the shoulder girdle and the arms, the upper extremity. But the, the you, you have to have a certain level of balance, right? And you're going to find out real quick when you test yourself where your weakness lies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the easiest way to do that is simply stand on one foot. Let's see what you see what you look like standing on one foot. And you know, going back to that original assessment, shoes on, shoes off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. know, I would start shoes off. Always. Yeah. You know what? So some people that we've seen in here too, before we even go to a single leg balance, it's can you shift your body weight from side to side? So you're standing on both legs, but can you take a little bit wider stance, maybe yeah. slightly wider than shoulder width, and then shift your weight to the left and then shift your weight to the right. And it's it's interesting to me to see how many people have a really hard time with that body awareness too. Mm-hmm. What's happening at the knees? Are they dipping forward? Are they able to push their hips back behind them? Are they able to um, keep their keep their knee and their shin over their foot? Right. You know when they're doing this, and then what's happening up top as well with their with their shoulders and their chest. So, um, I mean, as as far as breaking down the la- lateral movement. Sometimes just having them start that way yeah, I mean, awareness. Yeah, just so you're talking about like hip or feet under hips and just like, let's just Slightly, wait, yeah. wait the right side more than the left side mm-hmm. and let's change the other side. And then obviously it can, it can, it can progress to let's stand on one foot. Mm-hmm. All right, stick the, the foot that's hovering out in front of you, stick it behind you, you know, so you're going into hip flexion and hip extension, put it out to the side. Can you control above and below that hip? What mm-hmm. is going on? I, we've talked about feet. We've we've talked about uh, you know the importance of having strong feet, having good foot contact, awareness, and all that's in ankles on on other on other episodes. But that could be a problem for you, and that's where your shoe is being helpful or maybe not so helpful to help you maintain that balance. But but start with like that single leg stuff, right? And then you know maybe you turn that single leg you know, just standing on one single leg to a single leg kind of reach and touch. So now I'm on that one leg. Now I'm going to go into a hinge. You can even add flexion to it if you want. Try to reach down with the opposite hand, 
staring at my right foot, trying to reach to the floor mm -hmm. with my left hand. And out in front of me, maybe out to the side a little bit of a little bit of a 45 degree angle yep. across my body. These are ways to start warming up your hip yep. as well as kind of test what your kind of range looks and feels like for the day. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you could get a little bit more dynamic with that. Like, okay, so now let's switch over to the other side. And then maybe we just do like, it's a quick switch. Like, like from, alternating. Yeah, from one foot to the other foot, right? And then you can increase the distance between those feet. You can increase the power, yeah. the velocity, right? The altitude or the amplitude in which you're moving those things. So, and it turns into, you know, to ultimately it turns into kind of like an ice skater. But the bottom line is you need to be able to, but before lateral movement is going to be good for you, your body has to be really good at, re at transferring that load and receiving that load on the other side. Yeah. And don't take that for granted. Don't, don't think that that's going to happen easily if you only train on the platform or on the squat, mm -hmm. you know, under the squat rack or wherever else. If you are not training this, your body has some things that to, to, to begin to develop. And think about this. It starts at the floor. Your, your foot is, we're starting on a, we're starting on a stable platform. <laughs> Please do not fucking do this on a BOSU, like, or on some type of a, you know, a dynamic, like, um, Dynadisc um, yeah. or a Rx pad. S fucking stop that shit. Like, <laughs> on the turf. I, so this is the thing, like, you're talking about. The ground about, isn't like that. The so person doesn't have balance and you're taking them into an unsta unstable position to add more. You know, that's rule 101 when it comes to rehab. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what they do. That's the last thing I'm going to do with somebody. Once they have great awareness, the, now it's like, the platform. you know how to fucking stand on one mm -hmm. leg. Guess what? We might throw a little bit. I love the TRX, yep. right? Go ahead and sit back. They don't know how to load their hips into a one-legged transfer. Go ahead and sit back into this TRX. It's going to save you, right? And then all of a sudden, the body starts stops guarding, and I'm able to train these tissues properly, right? I need one adductor to be able to stretch. I need my whole lateral musculature to be able to decelerate Except and then produce that. force and come back the other way without, yep. like, loading my the top of my knee, right? I want to load my glutes and load my hips. Yeah, so you, if you go down, you're just kind of going through the joints there, like, go down to the ankle, like, Go ahead and start moving laterally real fast if you haven't done it for for a while, and um, do that in your in Yeezys or whatever it is. Most that heels are coming the off the ground. You're gonna roll that ankle. Yeah, right. It, you're, it's very likely you're gonna do that. So you know, and then or or you're gonna feel like, oh God, my IT band's so tight today. My lateral knee is so sore. No shit. Weird, mm -hmm. right? It's because your body wasn't ready for that stuff. Yeah. So start easy. Start to move through those movement patterns, and then you can start to do things. I, I, again, we start about the. This is a little bit of unilateral or isolateral movement on each side. We can add dynamics to that, like transfer over the top of a box to the other yes. side. That is good lateral movement as we're changing levels and we're changing different ranges. Um, and that's when the, the, the rotational components start to take a little bit more effect. So tra training that rotation and lateral movement together sort of goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to say sort of. It does. Absolutely. It, and it will. So, so uh, respect that. So now that's like, what do I do to load it? I would be loading it dynamically before I start to load it with weight in a lot of cases. So that's just like that single leg hop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Single leg transfer, things like that. And then if you don't have good coordination or you you don't have very good balance and that's a problem for you, okay, you just mentioned like, hey, let's do this on the TRX, right? My body uh, up top can be supported or my body down low can be supported by my body up top because I'm holding on to those rings or those mm -hmm. handles as I sit back into it. But those are ways to incorporate this stuff into your to your training program, right? To 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 begin to get comfortable with moving laterally. Please don't get out there and immediately start with a shuttle run. Yeah, no. yeah gee, that's <laughs> if you haven't done I mean, this before, you're you're you may be able to do it, but just because you can exactly. doesn't, doesn't mean you should. should. Uh, think about the again the same discrepancies you're going to find in rotation you'll find with your lateral movements, mm -hmm. right? So so take some time to understand what those are and re quote unquote test or assess them as you're putting these things in your program. Hey, am I getting better? Am I getting stronger? Am I getting tighter? Mm -hmm. uh, am I noticing like like I feel really strong on my hips, but God, my knees feel really weak. They feel like you know there's. They're going to kind of buckle or they're going to go off from underneath and maybe you need to spend more time with, you know, knee strengthening or ankle and foot strengthening and, and, uh, and mobility slash flexibility. So there's, there's things to, to, to keep in mind there. Um, the, 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 the programming piece and how you put it in there, people, people are probably listening to this, bro. I deadlift on Mondays. I squat on Wednesdays and I bench press on Fridays or whatever. 
like, where the hell would I put this into my program anyway? Like, I'm a bodybuilder. Like, do I really need to do this? I, it's, I'm purely just concerned with physique. I don't know. You decide, like, is this important for you? Is maximal strength and power output, uh, is that important for you? Because if it is, you should be rotating and moving laterally, period, end of story. Uh, if you're an athlete, if you're just trying to be fit for the game of life, whatever life might throw at you at any at any time, whether that's a pickup basketball game or some shit bag in the parking lot when you come out from the convenience store from, you know, from getting your gas or whatever else, like, or walking onto the jujitsu mat. If you're not moving laterally and rotating in, in your workouts, like at the gym to prepare for those kind of things, then you decide what's, what's important for you, but where would you put it in? Like, and how do you put it in? Like, how do you implement this in a program? I think we can go through that pretty, pretty quickly. So if I'm that person that's never done this before, I lift three to four days a week. It's mostly, you know, in, in a uh, yeah, sagittal plane, like, right. I push, I pull, I overhead press, I squat, I deadlift. I don't move side to side or rotate. Where would you put this in, in into your program? Would you put it in the beginning, the end, how many days a week, what? I think, you know, if you, if you don't do this, you can start with, you know, two days a week. And you can start it at the beginning of your workout when you're neurologically fresh. It doesn't have to take, you know, a long time. You could do a couple of sets of, you know, whatever, and then um, move into your your primary working um, sets of your... Of whatever, whatever, whatever you're, you're doing. doing. Yeah. Whatever you're doing for the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but... But CC, the gains, it's going to take away from the it's gains. definitely not going to take away from the yeah, gains. If that's the conversation we're having, then nothing that we're, we're, we're talking about is probably going to sink in anyways. But it yeah. will not. I mean, you could warm we're up. We're not overloading it. Yeah, light rotation with the band, even mm-hmm. just body weight. You work out, and at the end, you literally load high to low. How you're, however, whatever your programming dictates, right? So if I'm on my accessories and I'm in a power lifting phase, it's probably going to be six to eight reps, right? Yeah. All the accessories. Like, right. So you could... Start with the regular movement warm up, then go to your loading. But like we're telling people, you need to have a better awareness of this movement before you go ahead and load it, and especially before you go ballistically. Yep. Equal power. Yeah. Right? So to CC's point, like starting at the beginning when you're the most fresh, right? You're not overloading this with a t- with a ton mm-hmm. of you know weight, velocity, all those variables we talked about. Right. You're not overloading it at any point here. You're just turning things on, becoming. Uh, more neurologically, physically aware of what you're doing or you're not doing. Uh, you're, it's a reassessment each time you do it. And then over time, if you're starting to maybe pick it up and the progression that is in terms of, okay, I do want to load this. I do want to move a little bit more dynamically. I do want to move more explosively. Well, there's a time and a place to put that in. And I would still, anytime I'm adding explosive movements to my program, that's going to be at the beginning. Mm-hmm. That's that's generally going to be at the beginning uh, of my program. Again, for the same reasons, I'm fresh. These are the most dynamic. If I'm trying to produce the most amount of power, I want to be the most amount of fresh mm-hmm. that I can be in order to produce that power. I'm probably putting it towards the beginning. But there's no reason why you couldn't put a little rotation in to, you know, like a tri set of something or, or sorry, like a, a, a like a compound set of of something. Like I'm going from my on my push day or my pull day, adding in some type of rotational movement into my sequencing mm-hmm. uh, there and and load it up, right? If 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 the game is strength for this phase, then we're working through strength uh, reps and rep and set schemes. If it's power, I'm working through power rep and set schemes. And if it's if it's capacity, then maybe what I'm doing is adding a little bit more volume. It's a little mm-hmm. less weight. I'm adding it in more frequently. But yeah. you said, you know, start with like two days a week, mm-hmm. just like anything. Like if you're doing it less than two days a week, you're probably not going to get a lot of uh, additional adaptation after a certain period of time, right? Yeah, you know, but to be afraid of it, right? And and because it's going to take away from your gains or or something else. Again, if you're trying to be an athlete, um, put that stuff in there. I was going to say, I don't think it's going to take away from your gains. What it's going to take injury, away from bro. is it's yeah. going to take away from your longevity. Well, you see all these guys <laughs> in powerlifting now, dude. They're they're doing the FRC warm ups for their shoulders and their hips and everything before they squat. So, I mean, the the community is growing in an awareness of like, okay, we train in this very strict sagittal plane movement, and being able to now go in and train this before. After off days, I mean, it's a huge thing. So I think a lot of people are getting more aware to it. It's just how are they implementing? Yeah. So ways to implement it now, if you're not sure, like, oh, I heard you guys say a lot of stuff. I'm really not sure. Super simple. Go to uh, Red Dot Fitness on YouTube. We have a ton of videos out there. They're short videos. They're not like huge, long explanation videos, you know, on how to do this. So just quickly give you, you know, eight to 12 seconds of a demonstration 
there's a, you know, there's a caption there with a description of like how you might set yourself up from a position perspective. You could literally go to really any of like the dumbbell movements, certainly the kettlebell movements. We'll talk more about kettlebells here pretty soon. Um, the, the tubing movements, the, the, the suspension trainer movements, there's rotation, there's rotational movements in all of those, right? Uh, we even, you know, you'll see the barbell being used like with the landmine type movements. Um, you know, you could, you could implement those things in there as well. So there's a ton of that out there. Also, with regard to attacking those rotators or those tight areas and creating more mobility and flexibility and strength and awareness, um, we have a whole series of videos with Jeff in there, and these are long demo videos. Uh, and when I mean long, I just mean he's going to walk you through the entire sequence. So if you've you've done this little ass assessment on like, man, I'm really feeling this like in my low left hip. Um, cool. Just go to those movements that hit the pelvis and the low spine that are that are highlighted right there on the on the YouTube channel, and he'll walk you through the sequence, what you're doing how to do it, what to do if you're feeling this versus that, and 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 check that out. And if you have questions, you can always hit us with that. Um, you can do it on YouTube, or the best way to do it is to go to our website or call us. So rdftrainonline.com, when you hit there, you're going to you're gonna see like a contact page. You can hit us there. You know, just say you want to talk to Jeff or whatever, and you got a question for Jeff. Uh, if you're one of our members, our online members, then you obviously have the direct messaging system, and we get those quite a bit. Um, uh, so just send us a quick message. We could send you some videos or just, um, send you a, a couple of tips. It's a good way to, good way to do it. And again, if you're not a member you have, or you, you haven't explored those videos or you do, and you, you have a specific question or just a little confused or whatever, it's easy to reach out to us. I'd say probably the best way is to send an email that way we can maybe set up a time for, for mm -hmm. us to, to chat with you. But if you call and somebody's going to pick up the phone. Um, and if we got to get back to you, you know, with, uh, with some specific, sp some specifics from a specific coach like Jeff on that particular thing, um, that's what we're here to do.